Welcome to this second video on diodes. In the previous video, we introduced the topic of diodes, but we said that we were making some simplifications. We talked about the idea of ideal diodes. Now, in this second video, we're going to look in a little bit more detail about how diodes behave. And I would recommend, if you haven't already, to watch the previous video first before watching this second video on diode characteristics. But let's begin by firstly thinking about normal resistive components. So one of the topics we've looked at is Ohm's law. And Ohm's law, voltage equals current times resistance. What we can expect to see in a normal resistive component is if the voltage increases, the current increases. The two are proportional to one another. Or likewise, we could say that if the current increases, then the voltage is going to increase. So what we'll expect to see in a normal resistive component is, if I was to plot this graph here of voltage against current, I would expect to see this linear relationship between the two. So this is for a resistor, or a resistive component. Now what we see is with diodes, this is not the same thing. Uh, we'll not see this linear relationship, and in fact we see something slightly different. In a diode, as we increase the voltage, the current stays very low, and nothing much happens at first. And then, when we reach a certain voltage, then the current begins to increase, and that usually happens at around 0.6 or 0.7 volts. We give this the term the activation voltage, or the forward voltage. And what it means is, looking at that graph there, we don't have that nice linear relationship that we had in a resistor. We have this sort of non-linear relationship where there's this curved shape and the voltage will be around 0.7, or it'll have to be around 0.7, before the diode begins to conduct. So when we looked in our previous video at ideal diodes, we were kind of glossing over this fact. We were making things simpler for ourselves by ignoring this activation voltage. But in this video on diode characteristics, we're going to look at some more examples where we take this into account. Let's have a look at a similar example to the sort of question we looked at in the previous video. Now we can see again here, we've got a parallel arrangement of three resistors and each is connected in series to a diode. Now some of those diodes are in forward bias and some are in reverse bias. So the first thing we need to do is we need to look at which of these current branches are going to be allowed to flow. So I'll just label these very quickly as I1 flowing through R1, we've got I2 and we've got I3. Now if we have a look um, we see that current is flowing, if we assume from positive to negative, so flowing around in, in this sort of direction, then we're going to see that I1 is allowed to flow because the, the diode is in forward bias. I2, on the other hand, is not going to be allowed to flow, so we can rule uh, I2 out here, and I3 is going to be allowed to flow. So let's come up with some values for each of these currents, but we're going to take into account this new bit of information that we covered on the previous slide about the activation voltage or the forward voltage of these diodes. And we're going to assume that when these diodes are operating, they're dropping a voltage of 0.7 volts. So let's see how that affects our results. Let's look first of all at I1. So I1 is this top circuit branch that flows through R1 and then our diode. And we know the formula for current I is V divided by R, uh, voltage divided by resistance. But we've got to take something into account with our voltage. We can't just say that our supply voltage 9 is sufficient for this question because we know that of that 9 volts, 0.7 of it has been dropped across the diode. So our better formula is going to look like this. It's going to be Vs minus Vd. And by Vd, I mean the voltage across the diode and then divide that by R. So by putting some values in, we can say that Vs, we said, is 9 volts, minus 0 0.7, because that's how much we're going to assume in this instance is dropped across the diode, divided by R, which in this top branch here, we can assume is 720 ohms. And if I calculate that, I get an answer of 
11.53 times 10 to the minus 3. Or better expressed as 11.53 milliamps. Let's have a look now at I2. Well, I2 is something we don't even need to calculate because we know that that diode is in reverse bias. Um, it's not going to allow current to flow. And so I2 is 0 milliamps. Finally, let's have a look at I3 because we can do the same thing here. We can say that I3 using Ohm's law is going to be equal to uh, 9 minus 0 0.7, which we're assuming is the voltage dropped across the diode there, divided by 330. And that gives me an answer of 25.15 milliamps. Finally, we've worked out these three separate currents, I1, I2, and I3, but what we can also do thinking about Kirchhoff's current law, is we can work out IS, the current coming from the supply, the supply current. And IS in this case is going to be the sum of the three currents um, in this circuit. Kirchhoff's current law says that the current going into a junction is equal to the sum of the currents leaving that junction. So we can add these three currents together to get a total IS. So IS in this case is simply going to be uh, 11.53 plus 0 plus 25.15 and that gives me a total supply current of 36.68 milliamps. So this second video is just meant to illustrate uh, how diode characteristics affect our results slightly. We've gone from in the previous video looking at ideal diodes where we made some simplifications to a slightly more complicated example where we're taking into account the activation voltage or the forward voltage that changes our results and our working slightly in these kinds of questions.